will say that as the result of my long and intimate acquaintance with Mother Seton, I believe her to have been one of those truly chosen souls who, if placed in circumstances similar to those of St. Teresa or St. Francis du Chantal, would be equally remarkable in the scale of sanctity. For it seems to me impossible that there could be a greater elevation, purity, and love for God, for heaven, and for supernatural and eternal things than were to be found in her. Nothing could be more grand or more vast than her view of things. Nothing could exceed her readiness for sacrifice. Still, her views were not exaggerated, but characterized by a true wisdom and extremely averse to all vain speculation. Oh, the noble and right mind, Samuel Gabriel Brute, confessor to Mother Elizabeth Seton. Not to walk and play alone. Admiration of the clouds. Delight to sit alone by the waterside. Every leaf and flower or insect, animal, shades of clouds or waving trees. Vacant, unconnected thoughts of God and heaven. Bailey was born in New York on August 28, 1774, into a world at war. The colonies were fighting for their independence. New York was the center of the violent struggle. It resounded with the noise of distant battle. Horrors of Indian raids were reported from the immediate neighborhood. During the severe winter of 1780, the town ran out of food and fuel. Cold, hunger, and death threatened its citizens. Peace seemed unattainable and infinitely precious. Elizabeth Bailey had lost her mother when she was three. Her father, Dr. Richard Bailey, surgeon and Columbia University's first professor of anatomy, had remarried. There were several children from the second marriage. Still, the love between Richard Bailey 
and his daughter Elizabeth was strong enough to become a dominant element in both their lives. Richard Bailey was calm, grave, a man of science. To him, the child was everything his own nature lacked. He felt closer to her than to any other living person. Elizabeth was vivacious, sensitive, pious, full of a spirituality which extended from her love of nature to her intense religious feeling. To her, the father was security and guidance. Submission to firm but gentle fatherly authority was an essential element of her entire life. Elizabeth was reared in the Anglican church. She seemed to root firmly in it. Yet there was a restlessness in her early religious thinking indicative of search. that there were such places in America as I read of in novels, where people could be shut up from the world and pray. Many thoughts to run away to such places over the sea. And thoughts how silly to love anything on this earth. Thoughts about the vanity of earthly attachments ran through Elizabeth Seton's life. However, they stand in striking contrast to her nature, the mainspring of which was affection. Her attachments were numerous and intensive. Her love of God, of her father, and the love of her husband. When in 1794, she married William McGee Seaton. William Seaton was the son of a well-to-do merchant family quiet, gentle man. His sisters, Rebecca, Cecilia, and Harriet, were to become Elizabeth's closest friends. In the years to follow, five children were born into the quiet, harmonious Seton home. Anna Maria, William, Catherine, Richard, and Rebecca. They formed a large and important part of Elizabeth's world. A devoted mother and wife, Elizabeth Seaton found pleasure and peace in the fulfillment of her domestic duties. However, the peace was not a lasting one. William's health was failing. The restlessness of the political situation had serious repercussions on the Seaton fortune. Ships were seized and business failed. Caring for the young children, upholding her husband's sinking courage, Elizabeth's strength was put to a severe test. During the fall of 1801, a yellow fever epidemic struck New York. The suffering of the population was intense, and Elizabeth's sensitive nature shared it. Fighting the disease day and night, Dr. Bailey fell ill. Deeply distressed, Elizabeth nursed him until on September 17th, he died in her arms. Her loss could not have been more severe.
We must learn the hard lesson of submission. And once this has been accomplished, everything else will be rendered easy. To renounce our most cherished hopes. To console ourselves with discretion when agony rends our hearts. To rescue ourselves from the torpor which accompanies grief. To enter upon an active life even when we can find in it neither consolation nor even interest. This is proper to virtue and to a superior soul. The impact of her father's death was barely overcome when William Seaton's state of health became critical. In Leghorn, Italy, William Seaton had a friend and business associate, Antonio Felici. It was decided to go to Italy in order to find relief in the mild climate. Upon arrival, however, they found that news of the yellow fever epidemic had preceded them. William, although now desperately ill, with Elizabeth and Anna Maria, were held in quarantine at the Lazzaretto, a prison-like watchtower in Leghorn Harbor. God is with me, and if sufferings abound in us, his high consolations also abound. If the wind that now almost puts out my candle and blows on my William through every crevice and over our chimney like loud thunder could come from any but his command, miserable indeed would be our case. We pray and cry together until fatigue overpowers him, and then he says he is willing to go. Cheering up is useless. He seems easier after venting his sorrow. A heavy storm of wind which drives the sea against our window adds to his melancholy. If I should forget my God one moment at these times, I should go mad. But he hushes all. Oh, my heavenly Father, I know that these events are permitted and guided by thy wisdom, which only is light. We are in darkness. William Seaton died on December 27, 1803, a few days after being released from the Lazzaretto. To Elizabeth, a loss second only to the loss of her father. In Italy, Elizabeth was received into the house of Antonio Felici. Felici was a prominent banker an outstanding man acquainted with and appreciated by George Washington, Hamilton, Jefferson, Madison, and John Adams. His extreme efforts to assist Elizabeth with kindness and hospitality comforted her. Through him and his wife, Amabilia, she came into contact with Catholicism. went to the church of San Lorenzo, where a sensation of delight struck me so forcibly that as I approached the great altar formed of all the most precious stones and marbles that could be produced, 
My soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit rejoiceth in God my Savior. Came to my mind with a fervor which absorbed every other feeling. I don't know how to describe the awful effect of being where they told me God was present in their blessed sacrament and the tall, pale, meek, heavenly-looking man who did I don't know what, for I was at the side of the altar so that I could not look up without seeing his countenance on which many lights from the altar reflected and gave such a strange impression to my soul that I could not but cover my face with my hand and let the tears run. How happy would I be if I believed what these dear souls believe, that they possess God in the sacrament, and that he remains in their church and is carried to them when they are sick. Oh, my. When they carry the blessed sacrament under my window, while I feel the full loneliness and sadness of my case, I cannot stop the tears. The other day, in a moment of excessive distress, I fell on my knees without thinking when the Blessed Sacrament was carried by and cried in my agony to God to bless me if he, that my whole soul desired only Him. Antonio and Amabilia Felici had opened a door. Elizabeth Seton's encounter with Catholicism was more than anything else fulfillment spiritually, and above all spiritually, because her religious life was to center around the communion with God through the Blessed Sacrament. Mentally, because her active and inquisitive mind would settle only for truth, and truth she was to recognize in the apostolic tradition of the Catholic Church. In the summer of 1804, the peace Elizabeth Seton had found with the Felikis was shattered. When she informed her pastor, the Reverend Henry Hobart, and her friends of her decision to leave their church, the reaction was violent. Former friends began to treat her with hostility and contempt. Mr. Hobart was entirely out of all patience. He says, we have returned to the primitive doctrine and what more would you have when you act according to your best judgment? I tell him that would be enough for this world. But I fear for the next to meet another question. My soul is at stake. Far different is my case from those who are uninstructed. But my hard case is to have a head turned with instruction without the light in my soul to direct it where to rest. Passing the Roman church, I stopped. How joyfully would I enter there and kiss the steps of the altar. But, oh, Antonio, should I ever dare to bring there a doubtful, distracted mind, a confusion of fears and hesitation? Oh, my brother, if you could know the shocking and awful object presented to my mind in opposition to your church, you would say it is impossible, except a voice from heaven directed that I ever become a member of it. Miraculously, the voice from heaven directed spoke to Elizabeth Seaton. At the height of her distress and torture, at Epiphany 1805, Elizabeth opened Bordeloup's sermons and read, into whatsoever state of blindness and obscurity I may fall, in whatever state of disorder my faith may be. If I seek God in the simplicity of my heart, I will surely find him. She placed herself immediately under the guidance of Father Cheveris of Boston. On March 14, 1804, she made her profession of faith at the hands of Father Matthew O'Brien. On Annunciation Day, March 25th, she received her first Holy Communion in the Catholic Church.
It is done. I have received him. The period following Elizabeth Seton's conversion was one of inner happiness, but external struggle. William Seton had died, leaving his affairs in a desperate state. The Seton family, now hostile, like most former friends, refused to support his widow and children. Consequently, Elizabeth was compelled to find work. In the middle of May, she opened a school for girls together with a Mr. White. God bless you, my child. Remember Mother's first and last lesson to you. Seek God in all things. Anna Maria, Elizabeth's oldest daughter, was beginning to be a help. Still, the venture failed, and the school closed. In November, Elizabeth Seton opened a boarding house for the students of Mr. Harris, a Presbyterian clergyman. Soon, there were a dozen boys to cook, mend, and wash for. In 1806, to Elizabeth's great joy, sister-in-law Cecilia also became a member of the Catholic Church. She came to live with Elizabeth and to help with the work.
Cecilia, courageous and cheerful, and Anna, sensitive and quiet, both reflected important aspects of Elizabeth Seton's nature. Elizabeth loved them both profoundly. The heavy cloud has given place to the sunshine, and my soul is as free and contented as it had been burdened and afflicted. Now everything is easy. Poverty, suffering, displeasure of my friends, all lead me to him. Divine providence again became evident. In fall 1807, at a moment when Elizabeth Seton's position in New York had become precarious, Father Duborg, head of Baltimore's St. Mary's College, discussed with her the possibility of opening a school for girls in Baltimore. With Antonio Felici's help, the plan matured in early 1808. In June of that year, Elizabeth Seton and her family left for Baltimore. Baltimore was haven. Elizabeth moved into a small house on Paca Street near St. Mary's College. There she opened her school. My life is so different from what it was that I can scarcely realize it is the same life. Truly, it seems to me as if I had been born into a new existence. The school thrived, and Elizabeth Seton was soon joined by Cecilia O'Conway from Philadelphia. Susan Clossy from New York. Mary Murphy and Ann Butler from Baltimore. Father Duborg and Bishop Carroll, seeing that Elizabeth Seton was now regulating her life as one of religious seclusion, suggested that a religious community be formed. When Elizabeth Seton reluctantly agreed, Bishop Carroll confided the guidance of the community upon her, coming himself to bless her. He greeted her with the title Mother. Merciful God, thou knowest how unsuited I am to the charge that has been committed to me. I, who ought to blush in shame and confusion, how can I ever hope to direct others? On the 1st of June, 1809, the sisters improvised a habit, the black dress worn by Elizabeth Seton since William's death. On June 2nd, the Feast of Corpus Christi, the sisters appeared for the first time in their religious garb when they went to Mass in the seminary chapel. Father Duborg thought that Mother Seton, at least among the sisters, should make an act of consecration of her life, and she did so, privately taking her vows before Bishop Carroll. In Mother Seton, now grew the desire to devote herself to charity and the care of poor children. One day in church, she saw a wealthy convert, Mr. Samuel Cooper, and prayed that he be inspired to offer his assistance. The very same afternoon, Mr. Cooper came to Father Duborg and announced that he wished to donate 50 million francs toward the education of the poor, if Mother Seton could be won to participate in such work. A property in Emmitsburg, Maryland was purchased. In June 1809, the little community moved there.
Prophetic words accompanied Mother Seton on her journey. Father Cheveris had written, Already I see numerous choirs of virgins following you to the altar. I see your holy order diffusing itself in the different parts of the United States, spreading everywhere the good odor of Jesus Christ, and teaching by their angelic lives and their pious instructions how to serve God in purity and holiness. Prophetic words indeed. Out of the piety and devotion of a single soul, Mother Elizabeth Seaton, an organization dedicated to education and charity was to grow, the extent of which surpassed even Father Chevreux's vision. The first winter in Emmitsburg was spent in the so-called Stone House. There was little money for food and clothes. The sisters suffered greatly from hunger and cold, yet there was a quiet happiness among them. Dear, dear friend, consider what an extravagant idea it is that piety creates gloominess and disgust. Who thinks so is unacquainted with the anticipations of a soul whose views are chiefly pointed to another existence. It is inconceivable what liberty it enjoys. If you knew half the real good your friend possesses while the world thinks she is deprived of everything worth having, you would allow that she has truly and really the best of it. I think you will all come to see me next summer and take a laugh at our black gowns and demure looks, which, however, hide a set of as lively, merry hearts as ever met together. In spring 1810, the sisters moved into a new and larger building, the White House. There they opened their school, the first parochial school in the States. By the end of the year, there were 30 students, 40 poor children, and 12 sisters. I am at peace. Peace as found in the midst of 50 children the whole day long, save early in the morning and late in the evening. I am completely given up to that manner of life which in the world passes for hypocrisy or something of that sort. I am as a mother surrounded by numerous offspring. Their dispositions are different. They are not all equally lovable nor conform to all that pleases me. But the mother is bound to love them all, to furnish an example of cheerfulness and peace and resignation considering each one in particular and not according to the grades of merit or demerit, but as proceeding from the same source and tending to the same end.
In the peace and tranquility of the Emmitsburg Valley, the elements of Mother Seton's life, conflict, suffering, the search for God, and her deep spirituality, united to form the spiritual wealth which is sanctity. She imparted it to her work and the community which had formed around her and gave both the strength to last and to grow far beyond her own physical existence. In Emmitsburg, the decision was made to choose as a model for the community the Daughters of Charity, founded in the 17th century by St. Vincent de Paul in France. Father Flaget went to France to get a copy of the original Book of Rules and Regulations. When he brought it back, Father Duborg translated it. The rules were then modified by Bishop Carroll to suit the American conditions. In January 1812, it was presented to the sisters. They were given a trial year. After that, on July 19, 1813, they made vows. Father Dubois, founder of Mount St. Mary's, became the community's spiritual director. Thus was founded a distinctive American community, the Mother Seton Sisters of Charity. One last storm of anguish and suffering shook Mother Seton's soul. 1810, beloved Cecilia Seton died. Eighteen fourteen, Anna Maria died. In 1816, little Rebecca, youngest of the children, died. Rebecca laid so low beside Anina. Mother could think of nothing but Te Deum in the bitterest anguish and hearing the loud sobs around. The heart is high above. So pure the sky over the dear graves. Anna's already well covered with greenest moss and even a little violet in full flower on it. A long silence there. But communion tomorrow again and the next day and the next day. I see nothing in this world but the blue sky and the altars. All the rest is so plainly not to be looked at. Mother Seton had been ill. Her constitution was evidently broken. Gradually, she grew weaker. On January 2nd, 1821, 
Father Dubois administered the extreme unction. January 4th, 1821. 